So there was no light in the beginning. Now the light is back and check it out how many people are here. Look. So, all right, three instruments that you have. Number one is your resume, right? We've talked about resume. The, the right answer for ideal resume, you are very close. Not, not such a thing as an ideal resume. It actually, well, it, it, it exists, yeah. But ideal resume is the one you don't need. The one that doesn't <coughs> exist, but you don't need it. Let me explain. When you are such a great expert in JavaScript, whatever other language, I don't know many C++, like whatever other language you're trying to learn, when you become very good at that, and everybody knows, in Tashkent, if I need a JavaScript developer, I need to go to somebody like, I don't know, some name, Aziz, whatever, right? So this person is the best. He doesn't need a resume. Everybody knows that JavaScript, this guy. And you can be top 10, it doesn't need to be right away. Do we need the screen now? We don't need it, right? Because everybody's not looking at me, it's like, PDP are kidding, PDP are kidding. You're waiting for the file, it's not gonna happen, guys. It's gonna be in your Telegram. You can't open it. It's open for you. It's not opening, it's something wrong with that. Because I saved it. In my file, yeah, it's corrupted file, yeah. Because I saved it to another place, it's opening for me though. But, you see, it's not that bad. But uh, anyway, it doesn't matter, don't worry. Listen to me. Actually, it's better because you're not distracted with some images. Just listen, okay? I'm telling you important stuff. So, resume. No ideal resume, you need to be an expert. But, of course, it's too early for you to become a really good expert, right? So now you actually need a resume. Great resume makes it, you know, there, there are a few things. First, you were right, somewhere there said short, right? Who said short? Somewhere there is a short, short resume, right? One page, one page, yeah, one page. So yeah, even better than short. If you have two pages, I actually have two page resume, but I don't use them. Everybody knows me, like SEO, this guy. But uh, resume, one page is better than two. If you have two, the chances somebody will read it are very small. Why? Now imagine I'm hiring you, right? I have like 100 resumes, 100 at minimum, usually more hundreds, and I see them, and some are long, some are short, so when it's long, who needs those losers, right? They just like throw it away, basket, gone. So zero chance for you to even be seen, not to get a job, not to get an interview, even to get your resume seen. So make it one page, and make sure this one page is concise. You know the word concise? When it's short, but everything is there, so concise. Um, so make sure everything is there. Your experience, your education, your skills, maybe reference people, whatever, your talents, abilities, everything should be there. So it's so easy to learn how to make a great resume. So make it happen. Oh, I got 15%. Dang, it's really challenging today. Some sign there. But anyway, your second instrument is a LinkedIn profile. Who has a profile on LinkedIn? You see, many people have it, but I see a lot of you don't have it. Get a LinkedIn profile. Very, very useful tool. It's a social network, right, LinkedIn. Actually, we, Microsoft, own LinkedIn. It's our product, so we own a lot of things. But uh, LinkedIn, I get every two months, somebody reaches out to me and says, hey, can we hire you? Every two months. Used to be even more often. Like I used to be like every two weeks or every month, very often. I don't do anything. People just tell me, can we hire you? Can we pay you? This can be your case. But first, you need a LinkedIn resume, so LinkedIn profile. The key with LinkedIn profile, remember resume, short, one page, opposite on the LinkedIn profile. Long, as long as possible. Because you need to get everything there. Your achievements in life, your project that you work on, your publications, if you made any publications, obviously your experience, your education, everything is possible. So everything should be there. And you know, whatever they allow you. Sometimes they wouldn't allow you, but stuff like, you know, I love playing chess. Okay, so. Uh, but stuff that they allow you that's reasonable to have, like professional stuff. So of course you need to have examples of my, uh, my own LinkedIn profile here. So you need your picture there, 
photo is good. I ignore people with no photo because I get a lot of requests to connect, like 31, 32 almost thousand followers. And whenever there is no picture, no matter how cool they are, unless I know this, like Elon Musk or somebody, he doesn't need a picture. But somebody else, like, no, not interested. So get a picture. Make sure you don't say open for work, looking for opportunities, all that crap. Cut it. Don't do that. Have your profession as your title. Again, example, you're a data scientist, data scientist, data engineer, right? Or you know, JavaScript developer, backend developer, frontend developer, web designer, put it there. One line. Maybe something extra, but then when I search for somebody like you, like I need a JavaScript developer, I go to LinkedIn, there's a search bar, I search. LinkedIn, uh, I mean JavaScript developer in Tashkent. Then you will show up. If you say open for opportunities, you'll never show up, right? Because, you know, search engine works that way. That second, description, the summary of who you are, what you do, everything should be there, the jobs. Important thing about resume and LinkedIn profile. Don't talk about what you did. I don't care. Nobody cares what you did. What we care about is what you achieved when you were doing that, okay? I was responsible for this and this, so what? I worked on this and that. I don't care. When you say, I increased our revenue, you know, quarterly or whatever, annual revenue by 15% by doing this, this, and that, then I care, because I know you did something that I need. We need to increase our revenue. I increased traffic, I improved the product this way, and this is the metrics that we looked at, and it improved. Always base it on metrics. How do you measure success, right? So always do that. Uh, this is about LinkedIn, so make it full, and another, important part about LinkedIn profile uh, network. So reach out to people, ask them to connect with you. You know, who, who have LinkedIn, who has LinkedIn, you have followers, right? You have connections there, right? Probably 100, 200, I don't know, 1,000 maybe, but the more the better. The maximum is 30,000, you can get more. 30,000 is the maximum. Get there. Now, why it's important. First of all, these are your connections. Tanish Belish, remember? In American way. They know you now, they, when you reach out to them, they sh you show as first connection, immediate connection. Not like second, third, I know this one, and he knows that one, and then I can, no, not gonna work. So that's important, why, why you need to network. And second, this is how LinkedIn search works. LinkedIn search algorithm. You know, like Google, they have their own. It's not that strong. You can actually manipulate that. That's what SEO is actually, what my job is. Manipulate the algorithm. So what you can do, you have your profile, right? Full profile, everything is there. And now you have a lot of connections. So now if somebody is searching for JavaScript developer in Tashkent, you will show up first. Somebody with 24,000 connections will be second. Somebody with shorter profile will be third and so on. Simple, right? Huge profile, everything is there. Lots of words JavaScript mentioned in your experience, education area, like optimization, and then network. That's it, very simple. Third, when you apply, have you ever applied, you got a job, right? You applied for it, right? Or did somebody just hire you, just like, hey, he's my friend, like, no, you applied, right? So when you applied, you submitted your resume, and what else? Cover letter, beautiful, Anastasia, very good, very good. So, cover letter. What is cover letter? It's a short letter. Yes, perfect. Great, great uh, explain definition of cover letter. Like a description of why they should hire you, right? why, why are you a good fit for the company. Uh, normally, it's just one pager. Normally, it's just two paragraphs. Two paragraphs only. Paragraph number one. What do you talk about in paragraph number one? She knows my stuff. She's been to my other, you know, master class on very similar topic. Not just PM stuff, but. You don't know. Ah, no, no, I'm talking about, like, you, you don't know these people, right? Some company, some job opening, right? Some vacancy. You apply. You said. Yeah. 
So what he said right now, first paragraph, you describe your most important skills, and second paragraph, you uh, explain why and stuff like that. No. So it's wrong. Remember in the beginning, I started, what did I start with? I said, I'll talk about you, and only then I'll talk about myself. So when you apply, talk about them first. Now imagine you're hiring, right? You're hiring somebody. Somebody says, I'm the best, I did this, and I, my skills are like, do you care? But then they say, you are great as a company. I love your mission. I love what you guys are doing. That's why I want to work for you. You are the best, not me, you. Now you're interested, right? Like, oh, this guy is, he knows what he's talking about because we are really great, right? We're a great company. Everybody thinks they're great. So ego baiting, like a bit ego baiting. So first paragraph, you talk about them, why you want to work for them. What is their mission that drives it? And that's how you should choose the company. Don't just go for money. Money, like you IT people, you always make money. You will be in high demand all the time, guaranteed. So learn this stuff, technical stuff, high demand. No problem to get a job. But that's why you should choose. Many companies out there, you choose which one works for you by their values, by their mission. How are they changing the world for a better place, right? There are companies that are actually evil, bad companies, successful, but do bad things out there. No examples. But don't go for, to work for them. So first you talk about them, why they're great. And second, in the second paragraph, now you tell them why they should hire you. What do you have, what do you possess that they need? Again, not my skills, like I'm great and blah, 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 but what skills that you have, they need. Difference, you feel the difference? So in the job description, they tell you what they need. Like we need a JavaScript that developer that does this, this, and that, and you put it in your cover a little bit, like part of it and in your resume as well. By the way, when you apply, what happens today with all these companies, Netflix, Walmart, any big name, and even smaller ones right now, they use this system called ATS. ATS stands for Automated Testing System. What it means is that your resume is never seen by anyone, humans. No human being will see your resume ever until it passes this ATS system. So you apply. The system, the robot, the script, looks at your resume, reads it, because it can read the content, and then it has the job description, right? And compares. If it's not a match, it's out. Nobody will ever see it. If it's a match, it goes further to a recruiter who's hiring. Very important. So how to pass that ATS? Very easy. You have that job description, right, the vacancy, that says we need this person who will do this, this, and that. He will be responsible or she will be responsible for this, that, blah, blah, blah. So there are keywords there that you see often. If those keywords are not in your resume, add those. Because this is how ATS looks, keywords. No match, out. I see keyword here, I see the same keyword there. It's a match. It's a very stupid, simple system that you can trick by adding keywords. Very easy. So make sure you don't make that mistake. Go past that ATS. Next step, the recruiter, they read your resume. You know, if it's short enough, blah, 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 they will call you. But again, it's a chance. I'll talk more about chances. The thing here is this, this with the, your resume. Every job is different, right? Every company is different. They want different people. And you can't just apply for one job. It's really hard, it's gonna be, it's like a lottery. Even if you're a perfect 100% fit for this role, it's a lottery, because there are hundreds of others like you applying for the same role. Just by accident, they might not even see your resume. There's so many people, right? So, you apply for multiple jobs. That's what you do, right? When you, I hope you do. You'll be really stupid if you don't do that. Always apply for many jobs that are relevant to you, right? That are about you, what you can do. Make sure you can do it, actually, because I saw a guy, the other guy, then the other day, the guy reaches out to me and says, hey, I have this resume, perfect resume, some Indian dude built it for me, for money, for like 500 bucks. Like, why did you pay somebody to build your resume? It's like, stupid, weird. And I said, well, actually, it is a good resume. It's like, so awesome. I've never seen resumes like that. Maybe it was worth it. But can you do this? He says, no. Wait. It says like data science, blah, 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 data engineering. You're not a data scientist, no? Okay, 
So, okay, let's say it passes the ATS, recruiter calls you, recruiters are stupid, they have no idea about your job, right? They don't know JavaScript. So you can tell them, JavaScript, you know, it's such a product, like you build software, blah, blah, They will believe you. And you can pass that. Recruiter is easy. Next, hiring manager. Smarter than you are. That's why they're more successful. You can't trick it. So then, how would you pass if you don't know this stuff? They would say, so, it says you build this product. Let me, tell me more about this product. That's it. You failed right away. You wasted your time, their time, everybody's time. Why would you do this? So don't do that. Only apply to the jobs that you actually can do. Or you can learn how to do it. It's okay if you don't know, but you can learn. When you apply, apply for multiple jobs, but you have only one resume. Now it gets tricky. Every job is different. You need to pass the ATS, but you have one resume that will pass maybe 10% of those, maybe 5%. You want a 100%, right? What I do, and what I suggest you to do, have multiple variations of your resume. Actually, if you have only three, that's enough, because then you can vary it these three. That's what I do. Three different types of roles that I think I can do, I have three different resumes, and then I adjust it based on their keywords and stuff, and apply, apply, apply. And then, also I have, uh, you know, Windows has folders, right? Folders, in the File Explorer folders. So you don't change the name of your file, you know, Shavkat Karimov resume dot, uh, PM resume dot docs, doc x I think. Uh, but I, I have the same name, Shavkat Karimov resume, that's it, dot docs. But my folder says PM. My next folder says SEO, because it's my other thing that I can do. My third one says maybe entrepreneur, or whatever, and other things. Even for PM, product, project, program, remember? Different things. So that's what you do. You create those folders, name it per your skills, and then have the same file, but you know, obviously the same name of the file, but different file, and have it there. Thus, the, the title of the file stays the same, but actually that each file is different, because it's in different folder. You know they're different, they don't. They'll see your resume. Aziz Mahmoudov dot docs. Okay, so what have we learned? Three tools that we have. Resume, cover, uh, cover letter, and LinkedIn profile. So use those. Next step, now you have it. You graduate from the school. They told me actually the percentage of you who graduate is really high, those who get a job. So good news for you. If you pass the exam when you finish it, very good chances you'll get a job here locally. But if you want to get a job outside, it's possible. You don't have to go for these visas like we used to have, right? Green cards, all this stuff. Now you can work remotely. They don't, and it's great for them because you're cheaper than Americans or Canadians or whoever. But you're hungry, you can do more because you, you're young, right? You, you, want, you have more ambitions than they do. It's like people who come to Tashkent. Who is from Tashkent originally? Oh, a lot of you. Who is not from Tashkent? Who came here? So you guys, the rest of you, yeah, the rest of you, I love it. So the rest of you, stat statistically, will have more success in life. Why? Because you have more reasons to achieve. Tashkent people, I consider myself like a Tashkent person now. So you have more reasons, right? You come here, you're hungry, you need to achieve things. You probably don't own anything, you don't have your parents here, like these guys, right? You have to rent, you have to live with friends. That's why you, you, can, you have more ambitions. That's why you achieve more. Same with America, right? They're Americans, they're relaxed, they make a lot of money, they're happy, and now you come from Uzbekistan. For you, like 20,000, oh my God, 20,000. A lot of money. For them, it's like, I spend more than like one month, probably. So they, would, they wouldn't be interested. But for you, it's gonna be a lot. But 60, imagine, 100K a year for Uzbekistan. It's like $8,000 a month. Reasonable, right? You can live, you can be happy. In America, it's okay. It's, it's good money, but it's not like you're rich. Here, you're actually rich. In Uzbek Suns, it's gonna be probably like a lot of money, right? Billions. Probably. Actually, a billion bucks is like 100K, right? Approximately. More even. 100K thousand dollars is like billion plus Suns, right? So, it's a billion, billion, right? right away. But anyway, so what I'm saying is that now after COVID, things have changed. Now, remote work is possible. You can sit here and have that, that money, that kind of money, right? No benefits, no stocks most likely, but it's good enough. We'll talk about compensation, how these things work. 
So now you apply, right? You have your resume, your LinkedIn, and everything. You apply to the next stage. You're ready, right? You graduated, now you're ready. What do you do? You're ready, what do you do? Okay, you apply. It's very simple, you apply. You go and apply. You search first. Step number one, you search for a job. Step number two, you find jobs. Step number three, you apply for those jobs. So now I'll go after each step, because it's really, really important. Search is especially important, search. How do you search for a job? So in the global uh, area, right, in the world, there are big, big websites, job sites. I'll name you. And uh, they are not actually part of my presentation, so remember, okay? So you can search for it. First one, the easiest to remember, it's Google. Google Jobs. So you search for a job, you add vacancy, you add opening, you add something, it will show up multiple jobs. So Google now, in a few years now, became an aggregator of jobs for many, many sites, thousands of different websites. If you're looking for a JavaScript opening, like JavaScript developer job, JavaScript de developer role, it will show up like all the JavaScript jobs out there. Not everything, but a lot, because it aggregates. The biggest website on jobs on Earth, indeed.com, indeed.com. So go there, search for like the role, data scientist, web, PM, and, get, uh, and you'll get a lot of jobs. Because your goal is to find as many as possible. It's a numbers game. Remember this word, it's a numbers game. A game of numbers. So the more jobs you find, the more jobs you apply to, the more chances you'll get a job. So Google Jobs, indeed. Next one, LinkedIn Jobs. Huge, huge website for jobs as well. It's LinkedIn, same way you have a profile, right? And now there's a tab called Jobs. You click there and start searching. Fourth, Glassdoor. Have you heard of Glassdoor.com? So Glassdoor is the website that has reviews for companies, but it also has a lot of jobs, so you can find there. And the last one is called ZipRecruiter, huge website for jobs, ziprecruiter.com. Five, only these five. But they have maybe 95% of all jobs in America, or Western world, I would say, maybe European countries, maybe Canada, Australia, New Zealand, like mostly English-speaking countries, India, including Pakistan, Philippines. But... Um, 95%, not, not everything. So the other 5% are located on the websites of these companies. We have careers.microsoft.com, Amazon has amazon.jobs, Google has G Google Jobs, I think google.jobs as well, and so on. Every company, Netflix, Walmart, has its own website that has its own careers or jobs page. Some jobs that are posted there are not posted anywhere else. There are bureaucratic, political reasons for that, but it happens. And so if you want to have less competition, go there, Amazon.jobs, and you'll get thousands of Amazon, Amazon jobs. Right? Or Facebook, Meta, they have their own, and so on. Every single website, every single company has a website. Are these two for me, or? Oh, okay, because I'm like somebody else. Okay, that's good. All right, I like how you know everything, like, because somebody else did that, but anyway. Um, so, numbers game. Question for you guys. You send 100 applications. A lot, right? 100. A lot. By your conversion rate. What is conversion rate? It's how many jobs you applied for and then how many people or jobs responded to you. So that conversion rate, 0.9%. 0.9%. You keep silent, because she knows this stuff. How many responses will we get? 19, oh my God. What did we say? One? Not even, Not even one, beautiful, zero, right? It's easy to say zero, zero. You're wrong, learn math. 0.9% out of 100 is not one, it's zero. It's not 0 0.9, it's zero. Because there's not like half response like, oh yeah, we like you, but we'll never talk to you, you stupid. No, it doesn't work that way. They will either call you or not. Zero or one, that's it. Zero. So you spend your time, all the work. You build this resume, a cover letter. You thought about, I'll talk about them, blah, 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 all this crap, and no responses. So what do you do? 
What is it? You apply more. More resumes is part of this process, but apply more. How much more? 1,000. Send 1,000 applications in three months. Actually, in one month. Do it 40 applications a day. I did that before. It's possible. It's totally doable. 40 applications, so make it happen. It's hard work, right? Every day, your goal is to send 40, 40, 40 applications. 0.9%, how many? Nine. Nine, very good. So when you apply, and let's say out of nine, only 30% happen, that's three job offers. You are dreaming about having one, you have three. By the way, about job offers, never accept one. Always negotiate. When they give you an offer, some money, right? Some compensation. There's more, more than money there, like it's actual contract, right? agreement. But when they give you a number, they, they give it like in the bazaar. They know they're ready to pay more. They want you to negotiate. Because if you don't negotiate, you will get less. That's very straightforward. So don't be afraid. Always negotiate. That actually increases your value. You're so important, you wouldn't just take the job. Even psychologically, you think, this guy, damn it, this guy, we, wanna, we want him actually. Or this girl, right? We want this girl. Just like, not taking our job, damn it. It's like girls, when they say no to guys, what happens? Guys want to her more, right? When she says yes, he's like, well, he's like, a hooker, what the hell, like some prostitute? Why am I like, always yes, like girls, girls never say yes, same for you, a candidate, never say yes right away. Say, I love your offer, I'm very excited, I think it's awesome, I think it's generous, if it's generous, right? But uh, I th I, my minimal is this. If you increase it by like 15%, it's reasonable. More, see how much they want you. I've seen people getting 50% more. But what they do, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Meta, right? Three offers. Google says, I'll pay you $200,000 a year, plus benefits, plus stocks, blah, blah, blah. But Amazon says 210. So you go to Google and say 210 from Amazon. And they say, okay, 20. 220. Okay, Facebook, 220, but <laughs> they say, no, we're out. Our budget was 220. Okay, 220, but you have to choose. You say, okay, so this is 220, it's finished. 210, 220, Amazon, Amazon says 230. And then you get 300, 50% up. Possible, I've seen it. I haven't done it, but I negotiated. I got my better offer, because I only had one, and then Amazon was like, it's an interview. I didn't finish uh, interviews because Microsoft gave me an offer, and I accepted it when I got the Microsoft. But I did it with the other time. When I got this bulk job, I had 24 responses, 24 companies interested. I started my call with the recruiter. When they said, I want to talk to you, I said, Okay, guys, let's not waste time. Your time, my time. You know how valued time is? That's why I'm so crazy. Actually, I'm crazy. I'm mad about time. I hate when people are late. Time is important. It's not recoverable. So that's why I'm telling them it's not recoverable. You know, I love time. Let's not waste it. So this is how much I make. Can you, can you offer me more? I don't, I don't need it. I make it. Microsoft. The statistics don't lie. It's like, remember I told you, if you start a business, most of you will fail. Statistically, 99.99% of people who start a business fail. First three years. When people ask me for money, they say, invest, please. We like an amazing startup. I say, okay, how many years? Uh, we just started like two months ago. <sighs> Get out of here. You, two years, no. Three years, okay, interesting. Four years, oh, very interesting. If you survived four years, you know what you're doing. Because stats say, only 0.9% survive three years. But I have a second requirement. You gotta grow your business 20% each year or more. So if you don't grow, if you just survive, it's still not interesting. I will not give you my money. I earned that money, I don't wanna give it to you. Anyway, so uh, you applied, right? So now you got a job. Yeah, now you work basically. But we'll talk about careers. How do you improve your career? It's too early for us, I'll just cover it briefly. But in general, just in general, you take initiative. So your first day at work, right? You're happy now, you got a job, everything is great. Companies have a lot of people. Or oh, not a lot of people, it doesn't matter. They have people. These people work there for a while now. 
and they're tired. They're tired to work for the company. You are not tired, you're new. You have two advantages. First, you're young and new, fresh, right? Brand new, you have energy, they don't. Second, you have fresh eyes. You see things differently. When I work on Windows, I see things the way everybody sees it at Microsoft. You as a customer see it differently. You see all the problems, you see the PowerPoint. We don't see it, the PowerPoint for us works fine. Uh, you see it doesn't. That's my, my issue, like you said, like it's like some file issue. But anyway, because I did it actually on Google Slides. You see, I, I'm Microsoft, I'm building my slides on Google Slides, not on PowerPoint. Because Google Slides is better for me. I don't know. I can say that, I don't work for Microsoft anymore. But anyway, uh, it's a great product as well. More popular than Google, uh, Google Slides. Anyway, um, where I was going. Yeah, initiative. So when you are new, first few months you have this advantage, you see things differently. Every idea that you have is gonna be different from what they have. Fresh eyes, fresh look. So give it to them. Like with applications, you'll get a lot of rejections. It's okay. Rejections are part of life. Don't worry about rejections, okay? But uh, keep coming with ideas. Keep sending them anything you believe in, anything you think will improve the product or the company or the service that they're providing. Give them more and more ideas. They'll love you for that. You will make your career stable. They'll see, oh, that person, the new person, then amazing ideas all the time. And he's not tired. We tell him, no, it's stupid. It's a crazy idea. Nobody will ever buy it or whatever. You come up with another, another, and until you come up with something really, really good, great, great idea. And then it's implemented. So initiative, okay? So first time, don't be lazy. By the way, when I hire, one guy, I have a friend, multimillionaire, amazing guy, Edward Yim is his name. And uh, he taught me one very cool thing. When he hires, and that's what I do right now, he has a very simple principle. It's called FFF. FFF stands for fit, remember fit, fire, and function. So fit is that you might be the best JavaScript developer on earth, but if my team, my company, we all are, let's say, led back. We don't work hard, we work smart. We don't work like every day for 12 hours. We prefer four hour week like in Sweden, like maybe six hour week right now. Like I, I worked in Sweden. Lazy people, very smart though. And that's, let's say it's my mentality, my culture, my company. We are lazy, but we're smart. We don't want somebody hard working but stupid, right? And then you come, yeah, amazing JavaScript developer, but you will change our culture with your like attitude, like, like American attitude, like do, 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 every day, every single day, more, 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 achieve more, achieve more. We don't want that, we're relaxed. Or the other way around, right? My company, everybody is achiever. Everybody is a performer. And then you come from Uzbekistan, where like you drink tea at 10 o'clock, and then it's noon, you know, time for lunch, right? And then you go home. And you're like, America it doesn't work this time. It just doesn't work that way. So you have to work hard every day, like hours and hours and hours. Not, not a fit again, right? So fit. I want to make sure the candidate is a fit. And I can get it through the interview. When I talk to you, I don't just ask you questions. Oh, man, questions. I forgot about questions. We'll get to questions. Remind me, okay? Main part about interview, how to pass the interview. We just keep it. And nobody told me, like, yeah, yeah, I got a job, by the way. So you apply, you got a job, no interviews? Yeah. That's weird. So, yeah, I'll tell you about the interviews. It's very cool. We actually, I'll, I'll ask you a few questions, very difficult questions, actually. Let's see if you're smart. But before we get there, so let me finish the final part. Initiative, number one. Fit fire function, number two. So fit is like cultural fit. I wanna check, make sure that you fit our culture as a company. If you don't fit, no matter how great you are, we would never hire you. Function is like actual your skills, right? Your expertise. If you're a great developer, front end, back end, full stack, doesn't matter. It's great, if not, we'll check, we'll give you whiteboard, we'll see how you write a code. If you fail, you fail, if you're not, Second one, that's great. And third one, this fire thing. That's what I told you about initiative, remember? Fire, so your eyes, I've seen people very smart, great people, they could fit, but they had no fire. They were tired, they were like, they were talking like this. Yeah, I can do this, yeah. I think I can do it, I've done it before. So. You don't hire people like that, right? You want fire, you want them to, to show that they are really passionate about what they do. Because you lack energy at your company. People work for years, they're tired. And we need somebody who will pump them up, right? Who will tell them like, guys, let's do it. Let's make the best product in the world. They're ambitious, so fire, fire, show me the fire. When you talk on the interview, don't be like, 
be very passionate, okay? Even if it's not part of your nature. Don't overdo this because I've seen people like, I'm the best in the world, hey, come on. I'm like, do lucky it's Zoom, like, otherwise you'd kill me. Like, I've seen a woman, American woman who came to the interview, she had this bottle of water. She was like destroying the bottle. I was like, oh my God, I am afraid of this woman. I will never hire her. Too much passion. Okay, don't go there. But some passion, right? Don't be like, uh, I'm, I'm actually not really great, so don't, don't say stuff like that. It's no passion. Now interviews, let, let me go back. So interviews, oh yeah, with, uh, once you get a job, another six, second thing, important thing, network, like on LinkedIn, remember? But now within the company, build network. The more people you know personally inside your company, the easier it's gonna be for you to work there, right? So uh, what I did when I got a job, I would take every single person in my team to a lunch, separately, one-on-one -on -one lunch. I will never talk about the job, only about personal stuff. I'll tell them about myself, hear about them, and now we build this connection. I know what she loves, maybe she loves hiking, playing games, doesn't matter. I know it, and she knows what I love. So now when we work, it's so much easier because I know about her family, she knows about mine, it's so easy, we know we have something in common, maybe we both like hiking, maybe we go and hike in the mountains. So you build connections. It's all about people, right, everywhere, until robots start you know, working for us and with us. Let me get back to the interview and I'll finish with that one. Uh, question, tricky question, number one. I'll ask you only two questions. One is simple, another one is difficult, very difficult. Simple, let's start with simple. Uh, you want more? I can go all night, like I have tons of questions. But let me start with two. Simple one, okay. No light like it used to be right now, remember? No light, no internet, even worse. Nothing to do. And the house, in the house there are not so many people, but only seven people. All of them are sisters, seven sisters. Sister number one decided to play, uh, to maybe resolve, solve the crossroad. You know crosswords? Yeah. Crosswords, so she decided to solve it. She took some newspaper and she decided, okay, a little, some daylight, okay, so I'll do that. Second one thought, I'll just play chess. There's a board, so play chess. Third one decided, I'll just go clean some dishes. dishes. Fourth one said, I will just talk on the phone. Phone works, it's like stationary phone, no internet, no light, nothing, no electricity needed, just talk to a phone on the phone. Then it was fourth one or fifth one, doesn't matter. The sixth one says, I will clean the house. No, it was fifth one, clean, clean the house. And the sixth one will uh, wash the clothes, right? Wash and dryer machine, put it there, blah, 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 stuff like that. Seventh one, what does the seventh one do? Chess. That's why I told you, it's very simple. She plays chess with the one because there's nobody else to play. Very simple. Nobody will ask you that. Don't get too excited. Now a real one. Imagine you have two doors. That one and this one. Let's say it's a door. Imagine it's a door. Two doors. Door number one leads to happiness in life. You enter it, you will be happy forever. Door number two leads to unhappiness. You enter that one, you'll be unhappy forever. Tough choice. And you have to enter one of those doors. It gets tricky. In front of this door, there's a big guy, a guardian, who says, I will not let you in. And same big guy, almost his twin, over there. Big guy doesn't let you in. But they told you, okay, Let's make it happen for you, but very hard. One of them, this one or that one, I don't know. You don't know, nobody knows, but they know. One of them tells the truth all the time. Always the truth. And this one or that one, I don't know, always lies. Always, never says the truth, always lies. You got it, right? Two doors, two guardians, one says the truth, another says no truth, doesn't say the truth. Okay. You have only one question to ask. Only one question to ask. Any one of them, doesn't matter. Only one question. And figure out which door leads to happiness and which door leads to unhappiness. What would you ask? <laughs> it's 5 p.m., so. 
You don't know who is right, who is wrong. You don't know who says what. Ah, you know. Okay, okay, okay. So you figure out. He says 5, right now let's say it's 7 p.m., right? He says 5 a.m., he says 7 p.m. So you know he says the truth. That's your one question. That's it. How do you know the door? The second question. You have only one question. You can't make two questions in one. No, you can only ask one question. What about you like me? Okay, no. If you taste, then you uh, find your favorite mouth, would be easily. No, no. So, okay, no. Because you don't know which door, right? They say, okay, yes, I will let you in. My baby, it's the door to unhappiness. You're done. It's crude. What if I will show my phone and uh, they. Ask some question. Can you, uh, once you say right? No, you can only ask one question, no matter how you ask it. Phone, like anywhere, same oral. Question to, two persons. to any of them. You can ask on one of them, any of them. Oh. You can bo ask both of them, it's up so to you, but only one question. One of them tells all the lies, right? So, can I ask uh, how many doors are there? Yeah. Okay. So, so, one of them must say. Okay. Okay. Two. Choose one. You choose this one. Doesn't matter. You don't know who, what they say. They say there are five doors. So he's lying. So what? I go the, the, the second one. No, you don't know which one guides what. It's not like the truth guide guides the happiness. No, it might be the other way around. You don't know. You don't. You only know you have two guardians, two doors. You don't know which one is door, which door, which one is lying, which is not, and where they stand. You don't know that. But these guys know it's, uh, the they don't. They both know where the door is. One is lying. One one is not. Cool one, yes, very cool. Do you want to enter your door? So uh, the liar would say yes, but you don't know if he's a liar. And you know which door, so it doesn't tell you anything. Okay, the right answer. You see, I told you it's going to be difficult. Now listen carefully. I will ask any of them, doesn't matter. This one, that one, because I don't know, right? So I'll ask, let's say this one, doesn't matter. If I ask the other guy about this door, that it leads to happiness, will he tell me yes, it leads to happiness, or will he tell me no, it leads to unhappiness? Now what will happen with this question? Let's say it's this first, so there are only two possible scenarios, right? There are only two guardians. Guardian number one, let's say this one. He is always lying. Let's say he's always lying, doesn't matter. Oh, let's say he's always saying the truth. So I ask him this question. If I ask the other guy, so he's always saying the truth, remember. If I ask the other guy, if that door leads to happiness, will he tell me yes or no? So he will say no. Why? And let's say that door is happiness. Because that guy is lying, right? So that door. So whatever he tells me, I choose the other door. Now imagine the second scenario. He is always lying. Same question. He's lying. If I ask that guy, if that door leads to happiness, is it, will he tell me yes or no? Again, he would say yes, because he's lying. What I do, again, I choose the other door. So with that question, no matter what the answer, I always choose the other door, and I'll be right. In both cases, I'll get to happiness. Now, why did I ask you this? Think about it, it's true. I thought about it 100 times, it's true. No trick, 100% true. But it doesn't matter, because sometimes, People ask you these kind of questions in the interview. Tricky questions. Not that hard, much easier, but a little bit hard. They want to make sure you are smart enough. And I'm talking about big companies. You know, Google stuff. Google used to ask this all the time, now they stopped. Political, some stuff, and also they understood actually, smart people are not the best people in the world. Because smart people, genius people particularly, they're terrible team players. They don't know how to work as a team. They have terrible emotional intelligence. Tons of issues. So they thought, no, we should ask a lot of other questions as well, not just this. Or maybe get rid of these questions. So actual questions that people ask on in the interview. Many of those are repeated all the time, so I'll tell you this. Question number one, tell me about yourself. Who can tell me about yourself quickly, as if we're in the interview? Quickly, like 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Who can, who can talk? Nobody, okay. You can? Okay. 
You apply for what role? Well, which role? Let's see. Like JavaScript developer? Yeah, I'm back-end developer. Back -end developer. Yeah. Okay, so back-end developer role, something like, I don't know, I have no idea, this Node.js, doesn't matter. So tell me about yourself. Very cool. So first of all, name is not important. I know your name, right? I have your resume. Why did I call you? But the rest is great. Don't talk about what you did again. Talk about your achievements. I achieved this, this, and that. I built this product. Have you heard of it? This, it does this and that. Amazing product. I can show you. So your achievements. not about like, I did this and that. But great. What I love about your answer, any answer, doesn't matter. Just because it happened. It's because you were prepared. So be prepared. If tomorrow the interview happens, now you failed right away because you can't even talk about yourself. You're like, I don't know what to say. Make sure you know every single word you'll say. When I ask you, tell me about yourself, at 2 a.m. at night, I wake you up. You wake up and say, okay, no problem, then tell me. Okay, so be ready. Practice, 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 and always be ready. Maybe up. Second question, tell me please about your biggest achievement in life, at work particularly. Biggest achievement. Okay? You don't have to do it right now, but again, prepare and make sure it's not lame. You know lame? So I need to be impressed, a little bit at least. I know you're students, you don't have a lot of things in your life yet, but you have something. At, at school, even here, maybe you are like top 1% at this school, right? This is your achievement. That's a cool achievement. I would be impressed. Anything else, anything you really achieve, you're proud of, but it's not lame? Like one guy told me, you know what? At home, I painted the wall by myself. First of all, it's irrelevant. So, okay, okay. But second, it's not impressive, right? Anybody can do it, most, most people can do it, like you paint. So, irrelevant, imp not impressive, don't do that. Make it impressive, make it relevant to the role, right? Okay, your biggest failure in life, or in, at work, life is like, nobody says about life. I'm thinking about happiness, life, but work. Your biggest failure. Tell me about the case or you know, the situation when you failed. So the key here, again, be prepared. If you say I never failed, you failed the interview right away. So here's your failure right away. You failed now. But nobody is perfect, right? We all fail all the time. We're humans. That's the beauty of humans, actually. We're imperfect. We're not perfect. So be ready to tell them a story, great story, short story, about your failure. And the key here, in the end of this story, tell them what you learned. Because that's what they're looking for. It's not about your failure. Everybody fails, they know. They want to hear that you are learning from your failures, right? So tell them that this has happened, this is what happened, but this is what I learned. And since then, I've never made this same mistake again, because I'm a learner. Right? You don't say, I'm a learner, blah, blah, but they will figure it out, because you are a learner. Ne next question they ask. You guys are tired? You good? Okay, not tired? Anybody wants to go home right now? Okay, if you want to go home, it's okay. Don't worry, I, I will not be offended. It's normal, because it's been like almost two hours probably, right? Yeah, it's been a while. We're finishing. Conflict resolutions. Tell me about the time when you had a conflict with somebody at work and what happened. There are, first of all, if you lie, you say, you know, I don't remember, I think I never had any conflicts. <laughs> I know you're lying. Have, with different people, right? Nobody's perfect again, but different people have different opinions, different interests, and even if we build the same product, we might have different perspective of how it should be done. That's a conflict. It doesn't need we need to fight. They're not asking you about how you fought, right? How good are you at fighting, wrestling, boxing, doesn't matter, no. They're asking you about how you resolve more like intellectual conflicts. When you had different ideas and how you came up with one idea that worked for everyone. Again, don't tell them a story where you won, where you, you were like smart or whatever, it doesn't matter. Tell them a story, maybe even better when you failed because they, they know that you are self-critical. That you're not like, I'm the best, I, like, I never fail, and I know I'm right. When somebody's disagreeing with me, they're worse than me and everything. Tell them the story maybe when you, you were wrong, but again, what it resulted with. What happened in the end? What kind of product actually 
was built in the end, okay? So these are the main questions they ask you. It's called behavioral questions. Second, hypothetical questions. Remember that Facebook stuff, when I asked you like Facebook dating, blah, blah, somebody started answering and I said, no, you shouldn't get data. So it's called hypothetical questions. They'll ask you questions about how they can do things, actual things in their lives, in their work lives. Google is working on a new product, Google Maps or whatever, some new feature on Google, in Google Maps, right? And then they ask, like, how would we do this? So this is a hypothetical question. So what do you do? Again, you start with clarifying questions. What are we doing this for? Who are our customers? There are two frameworks. It's in my uh, application. I know nobody's looking at the deck. That's okay. No deck? Yeah. Uh, later, check it out. There are two frameworks to answer these questions. One is called STAR. STAR stands for Situation, Task, Action, Result. So basically, when you answer somebody's questions, like behavioral even, but hypothetical, particularly hypothetical, you start with the situation. What happened? What is happening? Then you break it down to tasks. And then you take action, you say what action you took, and then what kind of result happened. That's a star method, mostly for behavioral questions. For hypothetical questions, it's a circle method. Circle stands for a lot of things, like customer, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea, don't remember. But you can, you can get it. It's a very, very cool framework. Basically, you start with clarifying, oh, C, C, circle, clarifying questions, C. I, I don't remember, it's something with like customer. So basically, you ask clarifying questions, and then you start with the customer. What the customer needs. Always, when you build something new, business, a product, doesn't matter, start with the customer. Never start with what you think is great, because what you think might be different from what people actually need. What do people need? Ask that yourself, and then try to answer that, right? And then circle stands for other things, but basically you go through this exercise by asking all the questions, then coming up with the ideas right away, right, in real time, and then criticizing your own ideas, prioritizing through these ideas, and then choosing the ones that you really, really think are the best ideas. And this is how you end answering this type of hypothetical question. And then there's third type of questions called probing. Probing questions are basically part of hypothetical questions and even behavioral, but they are trying to clarify details. You started answering, right? Let's say, tell me about your biggest achievement. You gave some nice, great achievement, and if it's not good enough for me, I'll start probe. I'll start asking you probing questions. Because, I don't know exact stats, but they say somewhere about 80% of people lie in their resumes and in interviews. People like lying. People always lie, a lot of times. So as us, as interviewers, we need to see, are you lying or not? Because you want to look better than you are. Many people, that's okay, it's normal. It's part of our human nature. We want to make great impression on people, right? So you lie most likely, but I have probing questions and I'll probe. Like you'll say, you know what? When I joined this company, my previous company, Startup, their traffic was like 100,000 people a month. After I joined, just in three months, I doubled it. It's 200,000 now. Yeah, great achievement. I think it's reasonable, impressive, yes. It's relevant to our role that we're hiring you for. But tell me more a little bit. What exactly did you do to double it? So if you're lying, how would you answer that? But maybe you're not fully lying. So you say, you know what I did? We wrote a lot of content on the website, right? And then we reached out to a lot of influencers and popular people. They talked about this, and then they, that sent us traffic. So then I say, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about, or she's, go, right? So now I see, but I still can ask you a lot of probing questions to figure out, do you understand what you're talking about? This is my goal, to make sure you will actually be successful at our company. Because I don't want to fail, I don't want you to fail, I don't want us to fail. I don't want to waste our time. Remember, I barely time. So I, want to, I, will, I will ask you probing questions, a lot of questions to make sure you're not lying. So basically, this is all about the questions. And now I will finish up by asking you if you have any questions for me. Okay, let's do it. You don't have to say that. You want to become a CEO at Microsoft? Yes. Maybe. You're crazy or what? Years. 
It's a terrible job, by the way. He makes $49 million a year, but his job is the worst, one of the worst in high tech. Why? I'll tell you. You don't want to be CEO at Microsoft. Okay, I'll ask you a question and then I'll tell you. I'm going to study next year at master's degree in London with big data and business intelligence. And I want to ask what I need. Is it true that specialists with big data? Oh yeah, big data is, is awesome. Yeah, big data is, yeah. Okay, what do you need? Tips. Tips. Cool. So, the question was like, I want to become a CEO of Microsoft and I'm, I'm going to get an MBA, uh, like master's degree in London for big, big data and stuff, right? So, big data is true. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, you know, we talk about AI and ML, right? So, AI is only possible with big data. So the way AI works, in order for it to become smart, to understand things, it needs a lot of data. Right? If it's not enough data, AI will fail, right? Because it wouldn't identify the patterns. So how AI becomes smarter? Out of massive amount of data, it starts seeing patterns, right? tendencies, other things. And this is how it becomes smarter than us because we are not able, we are unable to process that much data, human beings, small brain. They have massive you know, servers. Their brain is like Finland country, full of servers. How smart they are, much smarter than us. Of course they can process this big data. So it's a, it's a thing, it's gonna, it's have, it has huge future, so you're going the right path. You're going the wrong path, path in terms of wanting to become a CEO of Microsoft. Terrible, terrible, terrible dream to have. Why? Uh, so, you know, when you're running a huge company, you have a lot of accountability and responsibility. You're responsible for 200,000 people who work for Microsoft, 200,000. You know, somebody loses their job, being humiliated or abused at work, it's your fault. You are the face of Microsoft. Everybody knows Satya Nadella, the CEO. He failed because somebody was, you know, abused at his company. Moreover, Every now and then, the Senate, U.S. Senate, will invite you and will really try to push you like all the way they can. And they have a lot of power to make sure that you're doing the right job as a CEO of a big company, second biggest company in the world in terms of valuation, right? So you don't want that. It's a terrible job. It's, it's really hard. And it's hard to do. And not many people actually can do it. The MBA is not enough for that, trust me. And it's not, you don't even need MBA or whatever education. Satya is educated, but I don't think he's like some big smart professor or something. Most entrepreneurs, by the way, like Elon Musk, you name it, they don't have like huge education. Education is great, but it's not enough. Experience. Education, like in the beginning, is super important, obviously, right? Because you need to start something. If you not, don't know the basics, you will not go anywhere. But experience is most important. So don't, don't go there. It's... A lot of money, but you know, once you make a million, two million, five million, doesn't matter. Your life is going to be great anyway. Forty-nine million, more problems. So think about it, and don't try to be a leader just for the sake of being a leader or famous or whatever. If you're driven, like, it's a good idea to become CEO of Microsoft if you want to do something great within Microsoft. Like, if you have an idea of how to improve Windows, remember, one point four billion devices. Then, yes, if you know that the only way to improve it is become CEO of that company and then change things around. Then, yes, noble, noble um, wish. Okay, hope I answered your question. All right? Any other questions? Yes. Okay, let's start here and then you. Yeah. Mike, take a mic. Microphone. Just hold it, yeah. yeah. Uh, what is the value of diploma in Microsoft for, uh, when like applying? Okay, so I have zero degree in IT. Yeah. Uh, I have my first education is law, international law, diplomacy here, you know, University of World Economy, diplomacy, whatever it's called, so I got, got it from there. Second is filmmaking, irrelevant completely, so no, not important. But let's say if it's, it's me and then the other guy, who has a degree, like master's degree in computer science, right, or big data, something very relevant, obviously you'll be more interesting than me, right? So it gives you advantage, but it's not necessary. 
because I have a lot of experience, right? So when they build this Windows community, I told them, hey, I had my own social network called Zorker, 400,000 users worldwide. So I built that by myself and just one other guy, two of us, Japanese guy, but Naoki, my friend. But then uh, he was actually an engineer because I can't code and I was like every, everything else. And, uh, and Windows community is gonna be easy for me because I know how to do that. So they hired me to do that and I did that, right? So if you have that, no degree is necessary because you have experience. If you know experience, degree is really helpful. But degree plus experience, winning combination. So go for it. If you have time, you know, sometimes people have no time. I didn't have time to study and study and study, right? Computer science. And also, I, it requires a lot of talent. Like, I can't code. So you guys are very smart. If you can code, you're smart. For those of us who can't code, I think you can't code, right? Can you? Some. 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 I can do C++ some. C++ is like awesome. I can do it. I know a little bit of HTML. Yeah. Anyway. Great question, yes, get a degree. If you can't get it, don't worry about it. You'll get a job just because you know how to do this. Yes? Yeah, this is, I mean, I was asking that question because I'm 18 years old and I'm like, 18. whether I'm uh, whether to, about to choose whether to work immediately after, like. Oh, very good clarifying yeah. question. See, probing question, clarifying question. So he says, or I'm 18, maybe, yeah. right? I need to choose. Should I go and study or should I just start working? So go study, why? Not because you'll get education, degree, diploma, no. The best part about universities are the people, students, right? Other students. So imagine now you enter this university. A lot of other bright young people like you join and you make new friends. So you know many companies in the world are built by these friends from universities. That's the best value of university. I still have a lot of friends from my universities, still good, great friends and we might even do together something one day. So, so that's why you want to go there. Don't go to work right away. You're too young. You'll, you, it's going to be very hard for you. You'll be the worst. They'll give you, you won't even develop because they'll give you the worst tasks. Something like, hey, go make a copy. No, anybody can make a copy, right? You don't want to do that. But if you're smart enough, especially if you can build your own business, that's better. But first of all, go get education. Education like universities, they are late. Normally they are like five years late, by the way. So why these type of schools are better, academies and stuff like that? They teach you what is very up to date right now. The like latest technology. University, some professor at the university, he might did it like 10, 20, 50 years ago. It's old. Nobody uses that technology anymore, right? That software maybe. And he teaches you that, right? So academies like that, fast, up to date, modern stuff way more efficient. But again, university gives you more in terms of uh, connections, right? Your own friends, students and stuff like that. So go study, studying is great. Yeah, you were meaning specifically top universities or it doesn't I don't know, I have no idea. I wouldn't convince you to go to any particular university. I have no idea. Thank you very much. Yeah, cool. Oh, Stanford, go to Stanford. <laughs> okay, any, you had a question. Okay, and I'll see you next time. Yeah. Okay, two questions, get a mic and, and speak louder. Let's go with uh, three questions. So the first question is related to the job. Uh, the second is uh, personal. And the third is, yeah, the third is related to university. So I work at the uh, Inha University as a teacher. Inha University as and, a teacher. And uh, yes, yes uh, and I have a question. What, from your standpoint, how do you see the future of the universities? Because uh, what you have just said is exactly right, because what we teach is like not maybe five, but maybe 10 or more than 20 years uh, old uh, information, and we just pass that information to students, and I think this is not right. And these kind of uh, uh, like uh, education centers, they just uh, teach the right exactly important knowledge, and how do you think, what is the, uh, I also uh, like the Stanford University, MIT, or the there is also Korean University, like Seoul National. They are very top, very good at research. But from your own standpoint, how do you see the? Is there a future for university, or all the university is going to turn to the education centers? That's the first question related let, to. Let the, me answer, answer this, and the second and uh, third. Okay? okay, so I don't forget. Okay, first of all, future for universities. Uh, thank you for self-reflection. I love that you, as a teacher, understand that you know you teach sometimes a bit all the technology, all the stuff. 
So very kudos to you, good job for that. Uh, second of all, this is the key for you as, as teacher, you know, the problem with universities is that teachers don't have time to work or study by themselves, they teach, right? And then they get late. You only get up to date when you do it every day, like at work. Like for SEO, by the way, like I do it every day, search engine optimization, remember? And that's why Google makes 500 updates every year to their algorithm. So if you're not following every single day, you will be left over pretty quickly. If you don't work for one month, you don't know what's happening in Google. So many things changed. Websites run like crazy, right? You don't know what's happening. So that's why I need to work. That's why best to teachers, I think those who actually work, like if it's a, a programming stuff or code stuff, on your own time, doesn't, you don't have to work for others. As long as you self-develop and catch up with the latest technology, you will be a great teacher. In terms of overall future of universities, I think they will stay, they will exist, they'll just uh, transform. They'll become more modern, they'll figure out the, class, the shorter classes, the faster stuff, so they will just transform. Like you know what happened with uh, movie theaters in COVID, right? Nobody could go to movie theaters. So they started dying, it's a big business, multi-million dollar business. I think close to billion dollar business. And uh, for, for certain networks like AMC, Regal, but they figure out, so now AMC, I recently read on the news, AMC is renting out their movie theater for big Zoom calls. So they become modern, like, okay, people talk on Zoom all the time, let's, and it's gonna be huge, it's like completely new experience on a huge, you know, room like this, big screen, Zoom call. Like 5,000 people to 5,000 people talking, right? That's amazing, right? So they, they, they're modernizing, transforming. I think universities will transform like that. And again, Stanford. I know a lot of multimillionaires, I know a few personally, and, and like overall, who dropped from Stanford by figuring out some idea about business and then taking maybe two, three of them, dropping and building something that we know today like Google, you know, Netflix or whatever, a lot. So that tells you that the value of universities, again, people. So that's why they'll stay because they kind of attract the smart, they filter out the smartest who can enter because there are a lot of exams, right? Not many people can enter the university. And that helps them to retain the talent within their beautiful uh, you know, place where you don't worry about anything except for studying. It's another benefit about universities. It's a separate world. You enter the world, you enter the walls of university, it's a new world of studying, right? People don't think about other things. They're here to study, to learn. They're here all day from you know, one person to another, sharing their best experiences. They have to read a lot. So it's a beautiful world of studying that you can't get otherwise. But my, my personal standpoint is the best way to learn is, by, is to learn by yourself. What I mean is that nobody can teach you if you're not willing to learn. Like you know, any of your students, if they're not willing, no matter what you tell them, they wouldn't get it, right? So build the best thing you can do. If you forget everything I said today, but only remember one thing, only one thing, remember this. Learn how to learn, okay? Most important. If you learn how to learn, you're unbeatable. You'll always be successful because you can learn anything, right? New technology comes out, big data changes and becomes huge data, I don't know. You learn huge data then. So you, because you know how. You know how to be self-disciplined because it takes time, right? It takes a lot of effort, especially if you have a family, right? Kids, like you're running around, you have no, no opportunity. So you need to figure out how do you find time? Do you wake up at 4 a.m. when everybody speaks, and sleeps, and you watch a YouTube video, right? YouTube, amazing resource for knowledge, right? So learn, but university kind of formalizes it. So that's why it's very efficient because it's formalized. It helps you learn you know, in the right pace with the right uh, teachers and stuff like that. So I believe in the future of universities. I think they'll stay, but they'll transform. Second question, please. Okay, uh, I found this about this seminar through the LinkedIn, and uh, I also sent the, uh, the connection to you, but you didn't accept that That's yet. That's a personal one. Yeah. So I have 32,000 
followers. No, I, I don't ask you to accept. I'm just. Uh, uh, why? Oh, okay. uh, when I checked your profile, I I found that you did the the master's degree in in a c cinematography. That's quite interesting. Can you tell uh, how did it fit in the in the job that you did at Microsoft? As, uh, okay, I wouldn't talk about myself as much, right? Because maybe not very uh, useful. But filmmaking and IT. Just just one one quick thing. When you do something else in your life, let's say you work with animals, right? Or you do some, something with nature, right? completely irrelevant to IT. You have advantage. You have different types of type of thinking, right? When I went and came to Microsoft, they really valued me because every idea I said was completely different from what they think. Most, in most cases, it was really stupid. They said, I, are you like not a, you have a computer science degree? I said, no, oh, that's why. Right? Like stupid stuff, in most cases. But in some cases, it was way better than what anything they can think of because it's different, comes from the world of films, right? Or the law, legal stuff. So it did help me a lot. It will help you. Anything you learn in life will, will help you. Even let's say you're starting here right now, right? Actually, Big Zot's story is also very interesting, right? He came from a completely different field, oil. Oil, right? And now he's in, in computer science, CEO of PDP University, Eric Academy. So amazing. And can I say that the time frame? Yeah, two years. Two years. In just two years, you can shift it entirely, your entire career track from oil to IT and become super successful. Life example. <laughs> Life. And that's great. Again, when you go to academies, universities like that, you start seeing life examples like that, right? That it's possible. That you, you started in com computer science, and then something happened, and you feel like, uh, it's not what I want to do in my life. No. I want to help disabled people. Right? I want to go and help. Your life is going to be way more fulfilled than high tech, because you will see every day how you help every single person. Right? Much better by your computer degree or any education that you get will help you to automate things. So you don't just help one disabled person or two. Maybe you invent something that will help millions of them because you know high tech, right? Software, you build some software for people who are visually impaired, who can see well. At Microsoft, we do this all the time. When I create something on the website, they will never let me go live until accessibility team approves it. Accessibility is for anybody who is disabled. So if, if, let's say, on my website, the tap, you know, tap button on the keyboard, if you click it, you have to go through different parts of the website, right? If it doesn't work, they will never let it be published. Because people who have issues, any kind of health issues, they wouldn't be able to use this website as much as other people right? no disabilities. How important it is. So anything you learn in life really helps. Filmmaking helped me a lot. I know how to tell a story, right? So many stories, right? Pure IT people, they are so terrible, terrible emotional intelligence. They can't talk. That's why actually they choose this profession because they say, I don't want to work with people. I want to work with my computer. At home, by myself, different personality. So again, if you are that kind of person, that's okay. Don't never ever blame yourself, right? You are whatever you've been born, like your talents, your skills, Lack of skills, lack of talent, that's okay because this is you, you're unique. You can find your way in life to be, to be happy and make people around you happy as well. Uh, the job of the project manager. Uh, I heard that there is a role called uh, tech lead in the IT companies, usually in IT tech? industry. Tech lead. Technique? Tech lead. Tech lead, tech yeah, lead. Tech lead. Yeah, yeah, tech lead. So, tech is, lead, yeah. is the tech lead and project manager like similar things? No, or it's different. They are so, so PM can PM is not always a leader, so they don't lead teams. Sometimes they work. It's called IC, individual contributor. There's IC and then PM as people manager. Different PM, right? Uh, so PMs can be ICs and PMs. ICs like individual and then leading people. So team lead is a leader always. The people around this uh, below. Uh, so the structure, by the way, I forgot about one other thing. The career trajectory for PMs. So you start with a PM, then you're PM2. Stupid name, but you have to name it somehow. So PM, maybe one, two years, then they'll promote you to PM2. PM2 means more responsibilities, more work, more money, 
and maybe more people you work with. Better projects, higher high scale projects. Then after PM2, you become senior PM, senior PM. And then you become principal PM, and that's it. And then if you go grow further, you become like VP, director, you know, CEO, CEO, and then other anything you want to be, right? So team lead is like in the in between when mostly for PMs it's senior PM. You can until you're senior, you can be a lead, right? And team lead can be a software engineer, can be a PM. Depends on who you lead, right? So team lead is more like a common name for people who lead teams. Very simple actually. Uh, I hope I answer. I don't know much about team leads. I have never been in a team lead, so. Yeah, thank you, appreciate it. Any other questions or we finish? One more? Okay. Uh, Mike? You guys are tired? Tired, right? It's been a while, so, because I'm tired. Okay. My own career. Well, uh, uh, I actually, uh, I, I'm, as I said, I'm a backend developer right now. Back and yes, working for a company. But uh, I really like uh, run my own business, as you mentioned. I, I really want to create my own product. That's why I, uh, when I was studying, I knew my way. One day I become a PM, and after that, earning like experience, and then I create. Because yes. if you want to do something, you should be on it, which means like to be priced. So right now I have about the half year experience at Bacon side, and also I talk with the, with the guys who hire me and I really want to be PM at this company. So, uh, which is suitable time to switch my, like, uh, my backend to the like, PM? So it's already happening about the uh, half year. And what do you see? And after, okay, and after like during the PM, my career, when I feel I can create my own product. Okay, so there are no particular time frames, like two years, five years, five months. Obviously, it depends how fast you grow and, and everything. What I would suggest is like one, once you feel comfortable that you are an extremely good backend developer, this is the time. When you feel you stop growing that much, like you were growing and growing like fast, 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 and then it slowed down. And then it's like almost stagnated. You feel like you're not growing as much. You know most of the things in backend development, right? Now it's good. Maybe you can learn a new technology, but if you feel this technology is good enough for you, I think this is a good time to switch to a PM. And then, good idea to switch to a PM eventually because you'll now learn both sides of the business, right? You can know what to build and then you can build it. Most PMs, and this is, I have to tell you, this is why they're worse than you. I told you why they're better than you, right? Like a lot of stuff. But why they're worse than you, they can't build stuff by themselves. They need you. But you can, because you've learned it, right? So now, if you figure out the other part, what do you, what do you create? Then you have both. And when you become, again, super successful as a PM, so you build it, uh, preferably not one product, but a few products. Because multiple products help you understand multiple different things. So if you build multiple products, they were successful, not just build it, but they actually were successful. You get feedback from your customers, from your users, that say, amazing product, I love this product. You can get it, you can see it on, you know, on the internet, anywhere where you get your customers. So then I think it's gonna be a good time and also, don't just switch to become your own boss, right? Your own business. You have to have that idea that you believe in. Because without that idea, you'll fail. And also have enough money for at least one year. Because you will have no money. It's going to be tough. When you start, it's going to be very tough. Any business person can tell. So have financial pillow, as they say, okay? Cool? Okay. So that's it, or one more last question? Last chance. One last question, okay, guys? And that's it. Yes. Microphone. Okay. I'll use this chance to drink. Uh, I have a last question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what kind of uh, problems you meet on the programmers on your PM uh, working period? What kind of problems which m most of us are the coders yeah. and what we should avoid on our uh, future career period. As a PM or as a software engineer? As a software engineer. Okay, okay. so when you work with PMs, like as a PM, what kind of problems I saw when I work with engineers, right? Mm -hmm. That you should avoid. Okay, I'll tell you. Oh, do we have like two more hours? No? Yes? 
It's going to be a long story. Anyway, so, okay, I'll try to make it short. Uh, first of all, don't think that you are smarter than a PM. <laughs> why? Why? It's like with boss, right? But why? Because that's an actual problem. Most engineers, I know a lot of engineers, trust me, a lot, thousands, not hundreds, thousands, personally, friends, right? All of them think they're smarter than me. Me like PM, not me, they don't know me, they work with PMs, be more extroversial, be more open, right? Like you are right now, right? You're listening, you're not like hiding, like, you know, maybe those folks are less extroversial because they're far, you guys are more extroversial because you're not afraid. So don't be afraid. And this will actually help you in life like big time as well, not just with PMs, but in general. Because I'll tell you one quick thing, just quick thing. I know, you know everybody's tired, like, can, can he shut up finally? No, I will. Just, just one more thing. Luck. Luck. You see, he's tired already. Luck. What is luck? Nobody knows what luck is, but everybody actually knows what I'm saying, right? Luck. Yeah, luck is when you get lucky, basically. But luck is so powerful. Imagine you working hard. You send those 100, 1,000 applications, no luck. And somebody else, actually, it was in my university. I have a friend, genius, one Korean guy, amazing genius guy. I'm sure you can see short. My best friend, he's really, I can make fun of him, he's my good friend. But he's genius, actual genius, like Elon Musk level genius. You can't believe how smart he is. So we had 1,000 or so, like a lot of, like almost, really close to 1,000 uh, tickets in the last exam at the university that we need to prepare. I am the laziest person you ever meet. I'm very lazy, very lazy. So I thought 1,000, oh, that's a lot. I'll just pick one and learn. If I'm lucky, yes, no, okay, they'll, I'll fail, that's okay. I am very confident. Once I almost dropped out from my school because I just didn't go for three months. Tired, okay, so lazy, lazy. This guy is not lazy, that's why he's so smart, right? So he learned every single of those tickets except for one. He just didn't have enough time. He was studying at 6 a.m. the same day at the university, at 9 p.m. and 9 a.m. we had the exam. So he didn't have time to learn that one. It's a true story, I'm not lying. He got that ticket that he didn't learn, and I got my ticket that I learned. True story. We both didn't fail. Oh, if I felt that, it would be like, really weird. One ticket, like, what else to do? But he didn't fail because he's so smart. He was able to answer that one, even if he didn't prepare. How important the luck is, you see? And you can develop it. Trust me, today you'll learn how to become lucky in life. I'll teach you. Very easy. But requires some effort. So, this is how it works. Luck is everywhere. Everywhere. It's here right now. Somewhere. It's here. But some people notice luck, and some people don't. Introverts don't notice. Extroverts, they look everywhere, they might notice it. Not 100%, but they might. So what happened? One researcher, a scientist, had this hypothesis. So he said, okay, he made an announcement on the internet or newspaper somewhere. He said, if you are very lucky in life, please come over. If you have always like this, like I'm like super lucky in life, true. Very lucky, always lucky, except for today, general. You see, it happens to me only once in my life. People have it five times, right? Like, I have once, like, so super lucky. It depends on perception. Yeah, that's true, but also, you will remember this session, this master class, more, because it's unique, right? It has no light, and there's light, and there's no presentation, and there's presentation on your telegram, whatever. It's unique. But anyway, people like me, they say, whenever, you know, if I have to do something, like if I apply for a job, I only send one application, I usually get the response. And then he said, okay, group of people, like let's say 40 people came up, doesn't matter. And then he said, now, if you are very unlucky, like here, there's no even chair, right? But one place that's broken. I know there's no place like that, it's a nice building. But let's say there were chairs and only one is broken. So they say, I always, there's 100 people, I will always find that chair and sit on it and it will break. I'm so unlucky. Everything I do, 
always unlucky. There was a movie, some French movie about some unlucky guy, if you remember, Pierre Richard. So about 40 people came and said, yeah, we're like that. I am like that. I always am so unlucky. I don't know what to do. I hate my life. He said, okay, it's okay. So he got these two groups, right? One group went to one room like this. Another one is to another room. And he gave them a very simple task. He said, here's a newspaper. How many photos are in this newspaper? Please count. Whoever comes up first wins. So this is what happened. In the room number one with lucky people, two seconds later, first people, first person came out. Three seconds, second. And then in less than a minute, everybody came out. They couldn't talk to each other. They did it everything separately. They couldn't help each other. Nobody came out in the next hour from the other room. Why? I'll tell you why. In that newspaper, the first paper, the first sheet says, don't count those photographs. You won. Get out. Everybody who is lucky saw that. Everybody who is unlucky missed that. They were counting for us. They were too focused on the task. Introvert, not extrovert. So how to be lucky? Notice everything in your life. Who is wearing what? Women are better at this than guys, right? They always notice details. How many steps? How many people? What does that sign say? How, how is he looking at me? Anything. Anything. The, what is the brand of this? It's Sony, actually. And that one, too. So anything you notice, you, it feels like, why am, why am I doing this? But it builds your habit to notice. You're looking for a job, and you're unhappy, right? Maybe five years, you can't find a job. You have family to support. You can't find it. So you're going like this. You're unhappy. You're in yourself. The bus goes around you and says, we are looking for people like you, JavaScript developers, <laughs> OLX.UZ or EPAM, whatever it's called, like the, the Belarusian company. And you don't notice it because you're not noticing anything, right? You're unhappy. So start looking around everywhere. Notice everything. You'll be lucky in no time. You'll be very lucky. Trust me. Okay, and we'll finish on that. Cool? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.